From Gothic castles to quaint country cottages, hotels around the world welcome visitors through their doors. And while some guests check in, not everyone checks out. Just 50 kilometers north of London in Maidstone, physical evidence of a housemaid and her terrible secret still linger at this country inn. And in an Irish castle, the moments before a child's untimely death play out for all eternity. And said, did you hear that? Did you hear that? And what we both heard was la, 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 la. Come along to a world where ghosts roam the corridors and spirits fill the night. What is fact? What is fiction? Nothing is what it seems in a haunted hotel. Spending the night in an old hotel is like stepping back in time. But priceless antiques that add charm by day cast eerie shadows by night. Perhaps it is the clouds passing over the moon, or perhaps it is something more, something that defies explanation. Perhaps that private room is not so private after all. There is a lot more to the small island of Ireland than four leaf clovers and pints of Guinness. And we have stories about goblins and whatever, and leprechauns. You know, it's more real than a little guy in a green, green suit. It's poetic and it's not kitsch. Ireland's mystical heritage is full of fairies and banshees, myths and legends dating back to its Celtic roots. There's some pubs that you can go into and there's a, an old guy telling a story. And today the local pub has helped revive the art of Irish storytelling, keeping its past alive. My father was a great storyteller and I can remember the story of fairies and, you know, someone going onto the fairy hill and not emerging for a hundred years. And in the Midland town of Tullamore, the tales continue. But this time, instead of fairies, the topic turns to ghosts. Every town has a place that everyone thinks is haunted, and you have little kids going, oh, that's the haunted place, don't go in there, everyone tells you about it. Yeah, I have heard of Charlotte Castle. Charleville Forest Castle sits just outside Tullamore's town centre, down a long winding path beneath the cover of an ancient oak forest. But Charleville is not your typical hotel. Welcome to Charleville Castle. A closer look at the beautiful 200-year-old Gothic castle reveals a building in disrepair. And the guests staying at Charleville have the unique opportunity to be part of its restoration. What we are is um, a building in progress of restoration. So the money goes towards Charleville Heritage Fund, which if you come and stay, you're not just staying in a, in a gorgeous castle, but you're giving money to help save it. And then we start to tell you about our ghosts from its long slumber. And as she does so, the ghosts of past times are beginning to stir. Many believe Charville's ghosts span the centuries long before the castle was built. Some of these ghosts may date back to before Christianity came to Ireland, when the Druids, ancient Celtic priests, presided over the land. The Druids would have been here first being in the oak forest, they worshipped in, in the open areas.
The oak tree was considered sacred to the Druids. Some say the Druid ceremonies performed among Charleville's oaks brought about magical powers. And hundreds of years later, guests claim these powers still remain within the castle's stone walls. It was the winter solstice, which is the longest night of the year. That night, one of Charleville's overnight guests says she witnessed the Druid's powers firsthand. The land surrounding Chalville Castle in Tullamore Island was once home to Druids. According to history books, these ancient Celtic priests lived and died hundreds of years ago. But one inexplicable event has guests and hotel owner Bridget Vance wondering if they ever really left Chalville Castle. It started with her waking at three in the morning and seeing a man walk across the room. The room went cold. And then there appeared a group. They weren't clear, they were semi-transparent. And um, they raised their hands up and down like this, gently for a while, and then gradually they all just disappeared. but not without leaving a message behind. And then what we found out, according to spiritualists and whatnot, this is a, this is a blessing, because they wanted the, the area saved. Today, Bridget Vance, with the support of her guests, is doing just that. She uses proceeds from the hotel to refurbish and preserve Charleville, one step at a time literally. The latest ongoing project is the restoration of one of the castle's grand staircases. This is an important staircase that Francis Johnston, um, the architect, did, and he was known for his staircases. The woodwork here, you can kind of see the detail. But there is much more to this staircase than exquisite craftsmanship. It's very important because it was a scene of one of the tragedies in the house. The tragedy in question occurred over 200 years ago. When a young girl and her family lived in Charleville Castle. She was the daughter of the third Earl and Countess and her name was Harriet U. Adele. Harriet lived a charmed life inside the castle walls. Her nanny supervised all her daily activities. Harriet had been sent up to have her hands washed by her nanny. And that's four flights up the nursery. And upon coming down, she decided, being a child, to start singing and sliding down the banister. Harriet lost her balance and fell four stories to her death. She was around eight at the time. And she's one of our ghosts. Harriet's ancestors left the castle at the turn of the century, and it lay empty for almost 50 years. Harriet was all but forgotten. When the castle had been lived in for all those years and the man that had it before us 
was single and on his own and no children. When Bridget Vance and her young children first moved into the castle 15 years ago, they didn't know about Harriet and her tragic story. But strange things started to happen, and they began to wonder if they were alone in the castle. So when we came in, she started coming back. I think it's the children that bring her back in. Whenever they would venture near the back stairs, a murky presence would appear. And while it was too late to change Harriet's fate, Bridget Vance believes that her ghost helped deter another such tragedy. Our first experience was um, when we first moved here, my son was three and a half and he went missing and we were terrified. The castle got fearsome drops. You can walk down there. I mean, it is an unfinished castle. And fearful that he might tumble down the drops there, they launched uh, a search. Hours passed. And with the castle in such disrepair, Bridget feared the worst. But she knows now someone was looking out for her son. We found him at the bottom of the stairs. And he said, don't worry, mommy, a little girl held my hand. We didn't know the story of Harriet, by the way, then. Was it Harriet who had led the young boy to safety? Today, the family believes the strange phenomena were deliberate clues, meant to unlock the secret of her tragic past. We were upstairs in our bedroom, sound asleep, three o'clock in the morning. We both wake up, look at each other, and say, did you hear that? And what we both heard was, la, 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 la. And looked at each other and said, someone's gotten in. So we went out to the staircase, and there was no one. Then, an ear-piercing scream that echoed through the entire castle. I imagine what it was, was Harriet was singing, and then she fell and was screaming, going down. But despite Charleville Forest Castle's eerie history, and the ghostly goings on there, locals say there is nothing to be afraid of. People are still afraid of ghosts. But um, I think really that's the initial because we don't understand. We are afraid of what we don't understand. But nothing to fear from lost souls. Over seven and a half thousand kilometers across the Atlantic, another hotel, another tragic death, and another ghost who won't let her story be forgotten. Each year, tourists flock to the city of New Orleans to revel in its history, culture, and of course, nightlife. But just beneath the facade of this enchanting city, lies a hidden past, just waiting to resurface. New Orleans is a city with a 300-year bloody history of absolute violence, mayhem, chaos, degradation, revolution, triumph, misery, war, and insanity. It's a magnet for bad behavior, and uh, some people say the supernatural. Reminders of New Orleans' macabre past lurk around every corner of the city, and the luxurious Le Pavillon Hotel is no exception. Our guests are offered all sorts of special treats, and maybe one of those treats might be some of our, our unregistered guests.
Le Pavillon Hotel was built in 1907 and soon became known around the world as the Belle of the South. Today, the hotel is located in the business district. But once past the doorman, the modern world fades away and the splendor of Victorian New Orleans is reborn. The first thing that people notice is the chandeliers and, and the pillars in the lobby. You just see them standing there checking in and they'll forget that they're in line checking in because they're just looking at everything. There's so much to see. The luxurious touches continue to the gold-plated elevators, rooftop pool, and even to the bathrooms. In Suite 730, uh, we do have one of three Napoleon's original bathtubs, and these are made of solid marble, um, approximately five inches thick, and uh, they weigh um, just under two tons. While luxurious, Le Pavillon is not stuffy, and guests are encouraged to relax amid its casual southern charm. Hot chocolate, peanut butter and jelly, only in the Le Pavillon lobby. Each night in the lobby, guests enjoy the hotel's famous peanut butter and jelly hot chocolate social. And when the guests start talking, word of a ghost roaming the hotel travels fast. I, I can share a room with a ghost. As long as she stays at the desk and doesn't get in the bed with me, I'm fine. I think I'd probably move to the hotel next door. Uh, <laughs> I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna play with ghosts. While not all guests may be so comfortable about sharing their room with an uninvited visitor, for the staff, ghostly encounters are just part of the job. Myself, I'm a non-believer, but having seen what I've seen here at Le Pavillon, I have to be true to myself and know that I did see these things. It happened, and I'm beginning to get a little bit goosebumps right now as I'm talking about it. While the staff believe there are many ghosts that call Le Pavillon home, there is one lonely specter who seems to appear the most. Her name is Eva, and she lived, loved, and died suddenly, nearly 100 years ago. Eva, we believe, was a wealthy uh, woman who uh, was in the process of uh, coming to the age where she was going to be um, set up with a marriage. Eva was sent from her family mansion to Le Pavillon Hotel. There she was to wait for her ship to London, where she would marry a much older man. As she awaited word from her family, Eva met someone else and fell in love. But Eva's newfound happiness would soon be shattered. Shortly thereafter, she received a letter from her father, instructing her that her ship to London had arrived. Leaving Le Pavillon meant leaving behind the only true love she had ever known. She didn't want to leave, she didn't want to be married, she didn't want to have this done. But before she could be married, fate intervened. On the carriage ride to the port, the driver lost control. Eva was killed instantly, just outside of Le Pavillon Hotel. And some say she remains here today, walking the halls of the site of her first and last true love. Sometimes if you're just wandering around by yourself, you do sort of get a feeling like people are watching it like there's other people walking with you. And one night, staff say, the ghostly presence made herself known. I was going to do my uh, nightly inspection of the hotel just to make sure everything's OK. I looked by suite 630. It looked like someone was going in there. And I knew that the room was unoccupied, and there was not supposed to be anyone in that room. So I entered the room. And when I looked toward the bedroom, there was someone standing there. 
you know, and I think, you know, I kind of knew what it was, but then you almost don't want to believe things like that all the time. Since that night, the stories of sightings are uncannily similar. It is always a young woman in a long dress, standing by a window. There was a woman standing by the window, just looking out of the window, you know, nothing special. And my reaction was, oh my goodness, um, you know, somebody's in here and I've interrupted them. So I backed up a little bit and looked away. According to Jennifer, a chill permeated the room and an odd calm crept in. She had no reaction to me, which is odd, because as a guest being interrupted, I was like, wait a minute, she didn't react to me. And by the time all of that had settled in on me and I looked back into the room, she was gone. But Eva may not haunt alone. While her presence is felt in the hotel's most lavish quarters, staff say another faceless spirit roams the basement below. And this is an area where I have to bring you. Uh, La Centine Kitchen is what we call the basement here, La Centine Room. Um, we do many functions in here. It is meeting facility space for us at the La Pavillon. And this is actually an area where I have seen something. And I know other employees have seen. It was an older man, couldn't tell you what he was wearing, couldn't tell you about facial features or anything, but knew that there was a presence. No one knows who this mystery man is, and most are so frightened they do not even speak of his existence. But those wandering to the basement late at night do not need to talk about him to know he's there. No one knows for certain why Eva and any other ghost allegedly haunt Le Pavillon, but it seems each has their own reason to remain. If there's a ghost walking around in a building, there's a good reason for it. The ghosts want to be where the event happened, where this is the place. This is where I suffered. But ask locals why a ghost haunts, and they will say, in New Orleans, that's just the way it is. We are just so in tune to the fact there's a spiritual world. In most cases, it grew up with the understanding that there is something else out there. There's something out there that wants to connect with us. Maybe there's more than one thing. And that's the scary part, when we don't know what it is that wants to touch us. Just 50 kilometers outside the hustle and bustle of London is an idyllic world where time stands still. As soon as you leave London, you notice the difference straight away. It's a lot less cars on the road, and you see an awful lot more trees to start with. In the center of Kent lies the rural town of Maidstone. But the boutiques and cars along the high street are the extent of Maidstone's modern touches. Old country homes evoke memories of a simpler time. And in one such home, turned in, the history of Maidstone comes alive. We're at Larkville Priory Hotel in Maidstone in the Kent County, uh, also known as the Gardens of England. This is the old part of the building and the new part of the hotel. And staff at Larkfield say it's in the old part of the hotel where a young girl's life took a tragic turn, and her restless spirit wanders, still keeping guests awake deep into the night. Well, I try not to go into too many details. The last thing I want to do is them coming down so they couldn't sleep a wink all night. Today, the 52-room Larkfield Priory Hotel is a convenient spot for business meetings and holiday makers looking for a country retreat. But its history traces back to a time of strict religious and social codes. Codes that were broken within its walls with tragic results. Some say the legacy of the incident remains to this day.
In the late 1800s, the local vicar purchased the property for his family and servants, including a 16-year-old chambermaid named Charlotte. I think it would have been very, very strict, and she would have been limited to who she would have been able to speak to or where she would have been able to go. The vicar and his wife were demanding employers. For a young girl like Charlotte, the long, tedious hours were almost too much to bear. She, she was extremely lonely, and we believed that she had turned to the gardener for comfort that way. Separated from her family and isolated in the country house, Charlotte began a relationship with the head gardener. There wouldn't have been many people actually living around in this area. It would have been very sparse, so she would have probably just taken up as a friendship. But her search for comfort would bring even more pain. Charlotte became pregnant with the gardener's child. For the unmarried housemaid, it was the worst possible sin. It is a shameful thing to happen, especially with like, the vicar as, as the head of the house. It's been a very, very religious community, and things like this would not only shame the household, it would shame the whole community. But before her indiscretion had become obvious, Charlotte miscarried. She did struggle whilst losing the baby, which caused her to be extremely depressed from that stage. Charlotte returned to work, but the vicar's wife gave birth to a son, a harsh reminder of the child she had lost and the secret guilt she still carried. Locked in her room, she made a drastic decision. She took her own life. Today, the hotel restaurant stands on the very spot where Charlotte took her last breath. Here we are in the restaurant. Not a lot of the guests who come here do know that our table five is where one of the tragedies actually happened. This is where Charlotte hung herself. But table five is rarely occupied. It just seems too coincidental that, I mean, many people just will not sit at that table. It's just an eerie feeling that they get. Years ago, the hotel raised the floorboards of the restaurant, masking the last physical reminder of Charlotte's story. But it seems that even renovations and the passage of time could not hide her secret. There was always a damp patch that we couldn't explain on the floor. And no matter how many times we tried to, to wipe it off, it, it always came back. And the damp patch stayed there. But it did look like a blood stain. Hotel staff have taken measures to hide the stain. But still, Charlotte's memory is not forgotten. Terrible, unexplained cries that reverberate through the inn serve as a constant reminder of her anguished life and untimely death. As you're walking through the old block, you can always hear the floorboards creaking behind you as though someone's there. But it's in the kitchen where Charlotte spends most of her time. You see something move out of the corner of your eye as if someone's walked through the doors, but then the door's always shut. Then they, they walk through the kitchen, but look around. There's nobody there. Sometimes 
it's just a shadow passing. While other times, staff say it becomes hauntingly obvious someone is out there. It was in the kitchen. It was about half past 11 in the evening. I was due to manager that evening, so I wanted to make a sandwich, a bit hungry. And we saw something pass in the corner of our eye. Next thing we knew, all the pots and pans were just coming down off of the shelf. And we just looked at each other and ran. For some unknown reason, I got the feeling that there must have been some message. But what dark message is she trying to convey? Frightened guests and staff may never know. Many believe the secret lies with Charlotte, who seems destined to walk among the living, carrying the burden of her terrible shame for all eternity. From a ghostly chambermaid with a shameful secret, to a playful bellhop who just can't seem to give up his day job. Historic Route 66 stretches 3,300 kilometers from Chicago to Los Angeles. And those making the trek west often take a break from their journey to enjoy the dramatic scenery of Flagstaff, Arizona. We have the beautiful mountains, we have the beautiful deserts, we have 25 miles away, we have Sedona and the Red Rocks. Like Zane Gray, the author, said, Flagstaff is the center of all the most incredible things in the universe that you can meet all your spiritual needs here within about a 25 mile radius. Flagstaff's Hotel Monte Vista sits just one block north of historic Route 66. Its huge neon sign, a beacon to passing visitors in search of a little glamour in the Wild West. Known by locals as the Monte V, this crossroads hotel has long been a magnet to lost souls, some of whom may never have left. If people tell me they don't believe in ghosts, say, well, come spend a night with us and give us a try. <laughs> Built in 1927, the Monte Vista was the luxury destination for movie stars filming westerns in Arizona. And the hotel's rooms are named for its most famous guests. Our rooms are all completely unique. Each one we've tried to recreate to the character of the person that actually stayed there. Jane Russell was beautiful and she loved red, so in the room we have a big velvet red high-heeled chair. Humphrey Bogart was known for his smoking and his sexiness. He liked black and dark and glamour, and so do we. Today, guests staying in these rooms say they feel the luxury of its cinematic past. But the decor is not the only remnant of its history. Staff say the price of the room even includes a phantom bellboy, forever at your service. Room service. He knocks on the door and you'll hear, room service, and there's not a soul in the hallway. At this point, we don't have room service and there hasn't been room service for many years. Here we are, 222. There was a bellhop. He just loved the building so much. 222 is beautiful. You'll love it. Maybe he's still here trying to help people with their luggage. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hotel staff believe the phantom bellhop is an employee named Isaac. And while he died a half a century ago, Isaac continues to work and play at the hotel. The housekeepers will be in a room cleaning, and they end up, go out into the hallway, and every single light bulb and all the chandeliers is out. And there must be 60, 70 light bulbs in the hallways with all the side lamps and all the chandeliers. Or uh, uh, go enter the hallway, and the hallway pictures are uh, turned around or on their side or uh, something bizarre. 
Uh, and to solve that problem, we've just started gluing and screwing our pictures. No problems with the pictures anymore. <laughs> But not all of the ghostly activity at the historic Monte Vista is hospitable, as men spending the night on the third floor are bound to discover. In the 1930s, the hotel's third floor was the site of a horrible crime. Hey, Joe. How, How about a drink? There were girls, I guess, that did frequent the hotels in the area and found themselves in a bad situation. The girls had picked up a traveler along Route 66. To a wonderful evening. So glad that you were here. Cheers. A man with a taste for violence. While the prostitute slept, the man stabbed both women. Then he disappeared down the isolated motorway. Today, staff at the hotel remember the women's sad tale. Maybe the reason that the girls can't leave the building is because there, there is no press about the guy, uh, the gentleman that, that did this to them. It's their way of asking us, what about him? Silenced by death, staff say sightings of these women always occur between two and three in the morning, the exact time of their violent murder. More than 70 years later, many believe the souls of the brutalized prostitutes continue to take out their frustration on any man who dares spend the night on the third floor. Probably one of the most distinct memories I have of a guest that had an experience would be a gentleman who stayed in room 305. And he, him and his wife were both woken up in the early morning hours, between two and three in the morning. They said that they thought a chandelier had fallen out of the ceiling. The wife went back to sleep, but the husband was not so lucky. He said that he felt anxiety for the rest of the night. He said that um, he just felt like his heart was racing. He had the, the feeling that somebody was just standing at the foot of the bed, just staring at him all night long. Four days later, another couple checked out of the exact same room and had almost the identical experience. Swear my life. These young women, brutally cut down in the prime of their lives, are back and eager to take their revenge on the unsuspecting male patrons of the Monte Vista Hotel. And four and a half thousand kilometers away in Boston, Massachusetts, another long dead soul has returned to pay a visit to vulnerable hotel guests. I believe that there is something in that room. I believe that there is some kind of a, a, a presence. Why has he returned? And what does he want with the inhabitants of room 24? Boston, Massachusetts, the town where America's past and present meet. Towering skyscrapers and passing taxis mingle with historic buildings, cobblestone streets, and other remnants of the nation's humble beginnings. But just 50 kilometers beyond this historic city, in the town of Concord, lies a different world, seemingly untouched by centuries of change. When you come to Concord, you walk around, and you feel like you're stepping back in time. But Concord is much more than a picturesque tourist destination. 200 years ago, the future of America was defined in this quaint town. I feel honored to, to have visited the site where it all started. In 1775, the first shot of the Revolutionary War was fired. 
It became known as the shot heard round the world. Locals say you can hear it still. This is where it happened. The British were on that side of, of the river, the farmers across this river, and this is where the fight for freedom occurred. Concord's Colonial Inn has stood in the town for over 200 years. This traditional hotel offers guests a modern restaurant, a bar, and if you stay in room 24, perhaps even a ghost. I believe that there is something in that room. I believe that there is some kind of a, a, a presence. Today, this 56-room colonial-style hotel attracts guests from all over the world. But years ago, it was the private home of a well-respected physician named Dr. Minot. Dr. Minot led a simple life until April the 19th, 1775, when war came to his front door. British troops marched into Concord to destroy rebel weapon stores. Alerted by Paul Revere, a militia was raised to meet them at the North Bridge. The militia up on the hill noticed that there was smoke rising up from the town. And so they thought that the British were burning down their town. Someone in the militia, angered by the sight, drew his weapon. No one knows exactly who fired first, but the lone shot that rang out spooked the British troops, who fired into the crowd, killing eight. Dr. Minot rushed to the scene, opening his home, turning it into a makeshift hospital and treating the wounded. He's noted because he didn't only treat the Americans, he treated the British, so he treated all those who were injured. After the fateful day, Dr. Minot remained in the house and lived out his life in Concord. Over 200 years later, he is still remembered for his heroic efforts. Today, guests at the Colonial Inn can sleep where he once slept, work where he once worked, and maybe even walk alongside the local hero himself. Some people feel that Dr. Minot might still be here in the house, you know, acting as the in-house doctor, taking care of people, taking care of guests while they're here, and especially uh, when they're in room 24. One night, unsuspecting newlyweds checked into room 24. They left the next morning without a word of explanation. Two weeks later, the innkeeper received a letter. I was awoken in the middle of the night by a presence in the room. I opened my eyes and saw a grayish figure at the side of my bed. It was not a distinct person, but a shadowy mass in the shape of a standing figure. It remained still for a moment and then slowly floated to the foot of the bed where the apparition melted away. It was a terrifying experience, and upon relaying the story to my husband, he said the ghost was included with the price of the room. Many guests staying in room 24 have reported inexplicable temperature changes, from blazing hot to icy cold. Others have been terrified by a shallow breathing down the back of their necks, or white orbs coming towards them in the dead of night. She said that she had saw these little wisps of light that would show up, slowly move, vanish. And one guest says she felt the healing touch of the doctor coming back from beyond the grave. I woke up somewhere in the middle of the night. I couldn't see a clock. Um, and I had a bad stomach ache. And what happened next defies all reason. I felt a tingling sensation on the top of my head. I felt as if my body were vibrating, as if an electrical current was going through me. I just felt rigid. I couldn't move my hands, my feet. I was just rigid. That's when it occurred to me that the stomach ache was gone. Is it possible for the dead to cure the living? Is it possible that his connection to the Colonial Inn and the surrounding area is so strong 
that after hundreds of years, Dr. Binot's presence remains. Skeptics may have their doubts, but for the guests who have experienced the doctor's presence and healing touch firsthand, his ghost is very real. I do believe that, you know, when a house is so old or this inn is so old and so many events that have happened here, that there have to, you know, there's probably some trace of their experiences still within the house. And to stay in the room where uh, a noted person like Dr. Minot, and who is famous for treating the troops, for people who maybe appreciate history, can feel a little bit of a connection to him. For Carol McCabe and other guests of the Colonial Inn, that connection is stronger than they ever imagined. From majestic castles to quaint colonial inns, hotels all over have secrets hidden behind their walls and beneath their floors. Tales of love and of loss, of vibrant lives and violent deaths. In the daytime, the stories of these lost souls are forgotten but their ghosts stand ready to make their presence known when the lights go out.